Okay, thanks. And uh, since I, I took some inspiration from earlier speakers who were talking about Dante and the sins and so on, so I thought it was appropriate enough to change the title to AI Sins. <clears throat> and, but anyway, there will be, I mean, social impact and network science, so you have that also. <clears throat> or I stole some uh, bit of title from Prabhakar about what we learned from a referee because, well, this, this thing is all <clears throat> going to appear soon in CSEM as a viewpoint piece. And, and a lot of uh, what uh, the fight between me, me and, my ref, uh, and our referees features in, in, in the talk. <clears throat> so all this started because of uh, these things that all of you have probably seen in the papers where these luminaries like Stephen Hawking... Uh, by the way, I should say that this is a real vision talk unlike uh, Elias who, who um, cheated because he said it was a vision talk and then he put heavy Rademacher theorems in the talk. <laughs> but this is a real vision talk, no equations, no theorems. So this is about uh, what uh, Hawking and uh, Elon Musk and, and Bill Gates and so have been saying recently about the dangers of uh, AI and how it's going to wipe out humanity and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so uh, the background to this is that uh, before that came out in the papers, there was uh, something called a new institute called the Future of Life Institute and they issued some kind of open letter signed by well, a number of people but including some serious scientists and uh, AI researchers outlining what they called was a research program, or research priorities for AI. And they make a very reasonable statement. They say, now there is a broad consensus that AI is progressing very steadily and very fast and will have a large impact on society and will, this impact will keep increasing. And then, of course, because of this great potential, it's very important for to, <clears throat> to, to look into not only you know, ways, uh, research, ways into how to use, reap its benefits, but also avoid its potential pitfalls. So it's a very reasonable and uh, <clears throat> moderate statement. However, the, in the media, it was blown out to, into, <clears throat> into this doomsday scenarios of various kinds. But, <clears throat> uh, but of course, we know we, the media always do, does that. So if that was all there was to it, we would dismiss that and get another media <clears throat> hype. And, <clears throat> and there is some substance behind it. Uh, we saw that earlier in... Uh, John's talk in the morning as well, so some of these pictures were also in his talk. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, Deep Blue beating Kasparov, Watson winning Jeopardy, Lee all being beaten by Deep Blue and, and driverless cars. So, <clears throat> of course, these are very striking developments and uh, they are kind of the background against which this research priority statement was made and, and then, you know, blown up in the media to, <clears throat> uh, to these uh, doomsday scenarios. So, uh, you know, it, it, all that would be fine, except that uh, it has gone a little further than that because <clears throat> there have been uh, uh, people who published a couple of books and uh, <clears throat> the book on the left is called Superintelligence and written by a philosopher at Oxford and uh, Bill Gates was a, recently asked a, a question and he put two books as must read on his list and this was one of them. <clears throat> so I, I wonder if there, how many people have, have actually know about this book or, or even read it. Fortunately, only one, because the rest of you, I highly recommend not reading the book, but <laughs> unless you want to be, you know, really subjected to a very long torture process. And the, the one on the right is, uh, is by my own colleague at uh, Chalmers. Uh, he used to be a world-class mathematician until he suddenly has <laughs> undergone a transformation. But in, 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 uh, with respect to the book on the right, I can s certainly recommend reading a couple of chapters in it, which are very well written. But uh, a lot of the other stuff in the book is, again, on the same level as, as Bostrom. So, uh, so part of our motivation was to, <clears throat> was to discuss uh, you know, these kinds of um, uh, the, the views and so on expressed in these books and other places like this. <clears throat> so... Uh, so just to review some uh, uh, so-called arguments or pseudo-arguments about the so-called... Uh, so yeah, so both these books, certainly the title of the first one is, is there itself in the title Super Intelligence. And uh, the second one, the title Here Be Dragons, <clears throat> this refers to some medieval maps where they would put, you know, they would put a map of the world and they would put at various places pictures of dragons as areas where you should not venture into because there are serious dangers there. And so his um, viewpoint here is that, you know, among others, artificial intelligence is one of those viewpoints that we should not venture into because it has existential risks for humanity. 
<clears throat> so, well, what are the arguments that people make for, 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 for these positions? Now, one of the high-profile exp exponents of this view, a colleague of Prabhakar, I believe, <laughs> is, is Kurzweil, the well-known uh, 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 prof prophet of the future and so on. <clears throat> so, as far as I can see in his talks and his books, his basic argument is uh, this pi these pictures. So, he throws a, these pictures at you, uh, so the picture on the left, I mean, they're not important, they're just, everybody knows these pictures. So, this is Moore's law, exponential increase in, in uh, hardware processing capabilities. And then this is uh, uh, DNA sequencing, exponential decrease in the cost of sequencing, and so on. So, these are again remarkable technologies, and they certainly have a huge impact. But his argument is, well, throw uh, 10 more such figures and, and then say, hence, there's exponential increase in AI. And uh, so, uh, people say that he has more subtle arguments, but I, I've not been able to see any more subtlety than, than essentially that this picture really captures more or less everything that he has to say on, on, on the topic. And uh, also, you know, in these pictures, there is a definite sense in which there is exponential increase. But when he says exponential increase in AI, that, you know, that, that's a another of those leaps in, it doesn't really, mean, uh, it's not even clear what that means. Then if you go back to the original uh, argument, there's a interesting uh, paper from 1965 by, by a well-known British statistician called I.J. Good. So this was perhaps the first place where this argument was uh, enunciated. And so he makes a very interesting argument. He says, well, suppose that you have an, you define an ultra-intelligent machine as something that surpasses all intellectual activities of any man, however clever, and then the design being the design of machines being one such activity, the ultra-intelligent machine could devise even better machines, and so then of course you would have an intelligence explosion, and then the first such machine you make would be the last invention of man. So it's a very uh, uh, nice intelligent argument. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. I mean, as an armchair exercise in philosophy, of course, it's interesting. And then there is uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> so the uh, iconic argument from that book, uh, Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom, the philosopher from Oxford. So he says, uh, he, he conducts the following thought experiment. He says, supposing you have a superintelligent AI agent and the goal of this agent is to manufacture paper clips. <clears throat> so he's just given this very narrow task of manufacturing paper clips for whatever reason. <clears throat> but since this is super intelligent, and since uh, being super intelligent, it will proceed as efficiently as possible towards this objective of making paper clips. It will in, set up some instrumental sub goals that is, are markers on the way towards achieving the final goal. And <clears throat> being super intelligent, these sub goals could be a very vast number of different possibilities, including it could destroy humanity in the solar, solar system and uh, the universe in order to get the resources to make these bloody paper clips. So, so that's uh, Bostrom thought experiment. So, uh, well, in favor of it, you can say that it's it's an interesting thought experiment because it highlights the important point that even if the explicit goal <clears throat> that you set for an agent like this might be something relatively benign, like making paper clips, in theory, it's possible, of course, that <clears throat> the end result could could have uh, all kinds of unforeseen consequences including extremely dangerous ones. So, insofar as it's just that kind of observation, it's, uh, it, it's fine. But, but people seem to take this so seriously that they want, uh, on the basis of this, to set up a whole research programs on <clears throat> the existential risks of AI. I mean, the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom, he has a whole institute uh, set up for himself at Oxford whose whole, uh, reach, uh, the, the whole aim of this institute is existential risks to humanity, and when he says existential risks to humanity, he means this. <clears throat> we'll, talk, we'll see that there are other existential risks to humanity, but those don't figure on his list. This, this is the one that figures on his list. <clears throat> so, we just wanted to make a very simple point with uh, respect to these <clears throat> books and these speculations, that if you want to... Uh, take this seriously, so seriously that you make a whole research program about it or a whole institute devoted to it, then it seems like a minimal requirement that you should engage with the science and technology that you're talking about. And this is needed as a bare minimum to make an assessment of risks, timelines, and also to formulate concrete and informed responses. And if you read those two books, 
you will see that they conspicuously fail to do this. So they're, they're, in all of those uh, 300 pages plus of those two books <coughs> separately, the, <coughs> there is no engagement at all with what is AI, <coughs> the state of tech, science and technology of AI, machine learning, whatever you might call it today. And that seems like a, a, you know, this combination of first uh, main, claiming that AI is an existential risk that needs a big research effort right now and having absolutely no clue about what that technology is seems like a very uh, sort of a recipe for, 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 ig for, ig for ignorance, whatever you want to uh, call it. So anyway, so what, what is the state of AI today? Well, actually, the, <clears throat> there are some good reviews that appeared in, in Science and uh, Nature recently because of, again, people of, you know, <clears throat> The impact of machine learning AI is seen now across many different areas of science and engineering. And so uh, normally you would not see this in science and nature, but they commissioned two reviews by, by leading exponents in the area, one on machine learning in general, and the second one on, in particular on, on this uh, narrow topic, on this topic of deep learning. And of course we have uh, textbooks. There are now many textbooks that people use in in machine learning courses around the world. These are two books that we have used in our courses, and I'm sure others have used these, these are similar books in, in machine learning courses. So, if you do, if you just do that, uh, you know, the, the elementary exercise of reading a little bit about the state of AI machine learning today, or you've done this machine learning 101 from one of these books, you know that uh, simply because there is exponentially more data computing power does not entail exponential increase in AI, as Kurzweil was claiming. And also, like, uh, as good, there might be an interesting argument, but no machine learning AI algorithms currently or in the immediate future are actually working in this fashion, that they create uh, better versions of themselves. <clears throat> that they actually create an algorithm uh, that that these algorithms create other algorithms which are better than what they started with. So there's no such uh, science or technology where you don't find this in, in any of these uh, machine learning techniques. So if you put those arguments in the context of current science and engineering, then these arguments, especially the Kurzweil arguments, they collapse very quickly. A, a, another recent book that actually does, man, does attempt to put this in the context of what is current AI in machine learning is a book written by a so this person is an AI researcher. He does robotics at, I think, at University College London. <clears throat> so this book is called The Technological Singularity. And he, in this book, he examines many different uh, approaches to how you might uh, achieve AI. <clears throat> so for example, uh, you might uh, take the approach which is biologically inspired <clears throat> and, and you know, try to create a, a, a engineer a brain by doing a whole brain emulation of some sort. So this is what, uh, in, the, in the European Union, this, this is the Human Brain Project that was launched with great fanfare a few years ago. Or you can take a very computational approach, an engineering approach like Google's DeepMind, <coughs> DeepMind did. So there are, and in this book he examines concretely these different approaches to... <coughs> so uh, if you look at the first biologically inspired uh, approach, well, uh, people have been studying this thing called a nematode, nematode worm now for many years, trying to do exactly this, trying to understand the exact connections, connectome of the worm. And this is a pretty mo modest organism. There are about 300 neurons and 7,000 connections. And even that took them a huge amount of time to completely map out. But essentially, the full mapping was done in 2006. But the important thing is that at the end of the day, after they had done this complete mapping of the connectome of the nematode brain, they understood precisely zero about how its brain was working. I mean, there was no real insight about <clears throat> how, you know, even the even this modest worm <clears throat> does information processing or whatever in its brain. So there was no real understanding about the brain resulting from this kind of connectome approach. So again, this is another one of Kurtzweil's, uh, Kurtzweil's arguments that you know this is going to lead to. Uh, it does not follow even if you manage to do this. Uh, uh, the human brain is incomparably more complex, just taking the numbers, 86 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses. <clears throat> so it's a formidable, compared to the worm, it's a completely different scale. It's not going to be achieved in anywhere in the near future. But even if you did that, it's very questionable what that leads to. So this doesn't seem like a, a very, uh, anywhere close to uh, the, the, the scenarios that Kurt, Kurtzweil and co. have been talking about. 
so, so of course we know in uh, by now that uh, you know if you want to fly you don't study how birds fly but you build a plane an engineering approach so uh, in machine learning uh, there are many different uh, uh, area, sub areas within machine learning just represented in this figure the supervised learning and, and and unsupervised uh, sequential and many different types of learning in particular there is this area called reinforcement learning which might be very relevant to this area so if you look at the uh, uh, <coughs> the bostrom argument it is that <coughs> the paperclip maximizer takes an action it gets some reward proportional to the <coughs> number of paperclips produced as a result of that action and and, and so on uh, this is the way you might make the argument about the paperclip maximizer. So if you want to make this, uh, set this up in the context of machine learning techniques that you would apply, this is exactly the area of reinforcement learning, which is schematically illustrated by this principle, uh, by this picture. You have an agent that takes an action in an environment, and as a result of that, it gets some reward, and that uh, get, goes back into the feedback to the agent who then updates the policy and takes a new action and so on. So this is the a a area of reinforcement learning. And you could, uh, if you want to take that verbal argument of Bostrom and say, how would you implement that in a real agent? Maybe you would have to apply some kind of reinforcement learning <coughs> uh, approach, reinforcement learning method to the, to the <coughs> problem. And this is actually the, the, um, the, this is actually a combination of this and other techniques that was, that were used in the Google DeepMind uh, system that beat uh, Laser all at, at Go. <clears throat> so that was certainly a great engineering triumph and deservedly got the attention it did. And it was certainly a great advance in AI and machine learning and very interesting engineering, uh, uh, very uh, interesting and impressive engineering uh, achievement. But to go th from there again to <clears throat> the kind of scenario that Bostrom is talking about, um, so here's an example of what happens. So this is uh, from the DARPA, ch uh, DARPA challenge. So DARPA organizes these challenges for, for uh, robots and uh, how, how far they've got in training robots in order to you know, just carry out some simple tasks. So, and they, they use reinforcement learning in various ways to do, do this. So let's take a look at how successful this has been. So we can entertain ourselves with a few more uh, uh, seconds of the film, but the basic message is that you know uh, progress in this area has been extremely slow. So you have to, if you review the state of machine learning and AI today, you would say that very narrowly defined tasks that have been impressive achievements, and perhaps the most impressive one was the, the beating the, the uh, Go, <clears throat> beating the world champion at Go, the Deep Mind thing was perhaps the most impressive of recent achievements, but there have been others like, of course, auto autonomous driving or recognizing images. And so, so there have been very impressive achievements, but they've all been in very narrowly defined tasks and not general purpose. And the moment you do general purpose, as illustrated in that DAPA challenge, you see the difference between the, what, what you would like to achieve and what the current state is. And, and, and uh, here is a sentence from that same review paper in Nature from the three people who are best known, the, the leaders of the field of deep learning, they acknowledge themselves that major progress in AI will, will come only in the future through systems that combine representation learning with complex reasoning. So they acknowledge that you know, this is very far from what they have achieved. Impressive though they might be, those achievements of deep learning, they're very far from these very complex <coughs> tasks, uh, learning and uh, execution tasks that, <coughs> that you need in the general purpose uh, AI. So if you go back to the Bostrom paperclip maximizer, <coughs> if you see clearly immediately that the goal of that machine might be very narrowly defined, maximize the paperclips. But in, implicit in the argument is assuming a very general, extremely general purpose system that is able to set up a very uh, complex, sophisticated instrumental sub goals and actually execute them. So there's a big mismatch between <coughs> what currently is possible, those very narrow things, and, and the very general. So there's already a paradox in his setup because the goal is very narrowly defined, but the approach 
towards that goal is very, very general, presumes that there is a very general purpose um, mechanism available, which uh, is certainly not the case today in AI and machine learning. So uh, just a few exchanges with the referee now. So we were just trying to make what seemed to us to be very straightforward uh, um, argument, but the referee, we encountered great uh, obstacle in the referee. So one of the things he said is that uh, most AI researchers, they believe already that superintelligence is imminent. <clears throat> and they cited a, 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 a poll that has been made by Bostrom and one of his co-workers. <clears throat> what it, if you look a little close, closer at that, you see that the poll respondents were from these three conferences. One was a philosophy conference. The other is artificial general intelligence, which is a, a very different kind of community. And the third one is a Greek association for AI. So these were the people asked and claimed as very representative for what the current uh, AI and machine learning people claim about uh, whether superintelligence is imminent. And they, they, they seem to be completely unaware that NIPS, ICML, AAAI, these are the places where the question? Okay. <clears throat> and then the referee also said, uh, he, he uh, savaged us and said, you, you should go back and read this, uh, this, this piece by somebody called Sofgur. And we actually went and read that piece, and then it turns out that he's saying, it was, uh, he's saying exactly what we are saying. So first of all, he says that the number of people who think that superintelligence is, is imminent are in an extreme minority. And then he, went, he goes on to quote Bart Selman, who's a very well-known AI researcher in, at great length, makes lots of points, including that existential threat of AI is not considered a major, major threat by AI researchers. There is a big difference between mere logical possibility and actual implementation. And, and, you know, all, all other kinds of very, what's, the points that we were trying to make also, which are very obvious and natural, and in particular at the end, he makes, it's very important, he says, that unless there is more clarity on what a technology is capable of, there's nothing to safeguard against. So th there's no, uh, nothing to have this big research program and research institutes about if you don't, don't have a clue about what the technology actually is. So it was very strange that the referee gives us this to read <coughs> as an argument uh, against <laughs> what we were saying. So at the end, the conclusion for us is that, now here I quote Andrew Ning, who is actually one of the main leaders in the field, that maybe hundreds, thousands years from now, there may be some AI that goes malicious, but that's so far away that I don't know how to work productively on that right now. And then a stronger statement by another philosopher who is well, in the other camp says that it's, it's a distracting real world preoccupation who uh, might worry people in leisure societies like the two authors of those two books I showed you earlier, but they, they, well, they can be escaped from the real evils oppressing humanity. So uh, another thing that we uh, did in the, uh, we, we, uh, in the article, we compared it to other existential threats. So here are two, climate change and, and the CRISPR gene ed editing technologies, which we certainly can see as very... Uh, real dangers. And here, the, the contrast with, with the AI as an existential threat is, well, first of all, you have a, a very good understanding of the, of, the, of the risks. You have a good understanding of the science and technology. You know that the, what kind of stabilization wedge for carbon emissions at 350 to 450 parts per million. You, you know that the, the maximum amount of temperature rise beyond which things will be irre irreversibly um, towards the uh, <clears throat> catastrophic situation is something like two degrees Celsius. So, a very quantitative assessment of the risks and timelines, <clears throat> and uh, also very uh, uh, concrete response strategies about how to mitigate emissions and so on. Similarly, in, in CRISPR, you have a, now a very good understanding of the technologies involved, the risks involved, and <clears throat> the timelines are, are, are now and in the immediate future. So. Again, we thought, you know, this is an example to show <clears throat> that when you make an assessment, you know, these are examples where the, the threats are very clearly articulated and you can <clears throat> have research programs and so on around these if <clears throat> that is the goal. So the referee objected to this as well and says, well, so his point was that he says the, the climate change situation argues in his favor because it shows that, that you should not wait till the risk is quantifiable. <clears throat> it's a very bad idea to wait until you can fall make the risk quantifiable. So, uh, of course, our response to this was, if you think, he says that climate change, we are doomed already, 
well, you certainly don't need to worry about AI in that case. <clears throat> and then uh, for CRISPR, he said that this is also <clears throat> uh, argues in, in his favor against us because he says that this, uh, the history of genetics shows that you can take wise decisions before the technology is available and the risk is quantifiable. <clears throat> so our response to this was, well, uh, you can certainly take some actions, for example, the, I mean, to say that uh, you should not have uh, or argue against existential risks does not mean that you can't take any actions whatsoever. <clears throat> you can certainly take, for example, a, an example action that you could take now, which is highly desirable, is to have a ban on autonomous weapons. So even before we understand everything completely, we can surely institute such a ban. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the argument we are making doesn't say that you should not have any action whatsoever, just not the actions that they in this camp want to set up research programs about existential risks of AI. So anyway, there are some more arguments from the, from the referee, but we, let's go back now to, to, to change to, to the real uh, threats and real sins of AI. This is illustrated by a nice picture here. So, <clears throat> so first, you only humans could drive cars, well, that's, that's uh, in the garbage. Only humans could fire missiles, that's in the garbage. Only humans can recognize faces, that's in the garbage. So <clears throat> there are, uh, the, the number of lists, list of tasks that only humans can perform is, is shrinking ever rapidly, certainly in, when, in, in narrow, <clears throat> narrowly defined tasks. So that is uh, certain, certainly a, a, a real threat. So here's an exam another example. So here is a, a description of uh, sports events. So this is uh, about Leicester City, which won the Premier League in the US. And this is a description of their season <coughs> written in, by two different uh, people. The first one <coughs> is by a, a sports journalist. And the second one is written by a computer, completely automated, <coughs> given the same data. And so if you read it, you, see, you, you will see that it's very hard to make, make out which one is the computer and which one is, is the... So this is an example of a, a Turing test of some kind. So just reading this, you wouldn't be very, very hard pressed to say which was the sports journalist and which was actually produced, automated by this, by this program. <coughs> so for even the first line <coughs> that the computer generated report says, it was a season for the ages for Leicester City. So there's even a nice literary uh, element to it. So these developments have certainly, uh, they certainly point to very real imminent dangers in these dangers have been <clears throat> brought out very forcefully in, in, in these books. So the one in the center is a very well-known book. Today is probably the best-known book so go <clears throat> that makes this argument. It's called The Second Machine Age. <clears throat> so the first machine age is the Industrial Revolution, and the second machine age is, is uh, the age of automation. And the one on the left is... Uh, perhaps not as well known because, because the authors in the, of the first, the one in the middle, they are two very well known MIT economists. <clears throat> so they get a lot of publicity attention. The one on the left is written by somebody who actually has no official affiliation. He's a computer professional, but the book is very well written and very well argued. But both those books give very, they give an extensive set of examples how, of how, again, I can take the, uh, the description from John's talk in the morning. He said, uh, computers entering uh, human activities in a disruptive way. And so these books give, an, give many examples of how this is happening, automation entering and disrupting, <clears throat> having major disrupting influences, I impacts on, on societies, on economies. And the one on the right is uh, the Swedish version that <clears throat> came out recently, uh, looking at the argument in the, in the Swedish context, making more or less the same kind of points. <clears throat> so here the situation is that we do understand the technology very well. Special purpose, narrowly defined AI machine learning technologies. <clears throat> they have been making dramatic progress and there is a pretty quantitative assessment. Uh, for example, these two reports, the first, the one <clears throat> made by a study from the Oxford Martin Institute that in the US, about 50% of jobs are at risk of being automated over the next 20 years. And the one uh, in Swedish is this, the pretty similar conclusions by a report that was commissioned in Sweden. It says that almost every other job, so the same 50% rate, <coughs> will be uh, uh, will will be non-existent in 20 years. <coughs> so very pretty similar conclusions, and probably the same applies to across many of the advanced economies today. So uh, 
another claim by Bill Gates that the AI dream is finally arriving. Well, I think in this one he did make a qualification that he was talking about these kinds of very narrow, narrowly defined <coughs> uh, impacts. Let's say the impacts on, on jobs and societies. Now, so some people argue that, well, why should this be any different from previous technologies? So we know throughout history that new technologies have always caused these disruptions. <clears throat> They've always resulted in this kind of uh, uh, situation where people are displaced from their jobs, but on the other hand, new technologies create new jobs, and so the same people who are displaced, they find other jobs in other areas. For example, with steam power and industrial revolution, this is certainly what happened. <clears throat> but both these books by Ford and the MIT economists, they make a powerful argument that this time actually is different from the earlier <coughs> transformations. And one of the, and the kind of the central argument about for this is that this auto automation is really all pervasive. So there is no niche that will be untouched by automation. So there is no such thing as will we find some other jobs that humans can do because those jobs can again also be subjected to automation. <coughs> so this is really a qualitative difference between and fundamental difference between earlier impacts of technologies and what's going, what, what will be pretty likely effects of this disruption. So, uh, so I, I don't have the time to, to elaborate more on this, but I'll just end, or start, come to the end by showing two example, two pieces of evidence in support of this. So, this is a, a study by uh, MIT economist uh, David Arthur, who is one of the best known people who work in this area, he shows the impact of, uh, of ICT technologies more generally, not just automation on, on jobs. And <clears throat> the difference here is that if you look at the top 1%, you know, the high earning jobs, the impact, the impact is positive. If you take the bottom, <clears throat> the very bottom, <clears throat> extremely low paying jobs, that is also positive. You have, maybe you have uh, positive impact at the extreme high end and extreme low end, but everything in middle is an extremely negative impact. So, so his studies show a very sharp polarization in the job market, where people in the, the, the middle gets hollowed out. And of course, that is the basis on, of the existence of many of the societies in, in the West today. So this is a, an example, a graphic example of the impact that these technologies will, will have on, on society. And um, that's uh, time for another film clip. So this is a film clip to show uh, an example of how automation is all pervasive. <clears throat> and uh, so this example... The camel racing season is in full swing at the Wakba racetrack in Abu Dhabi. It's a centuries-old sport in the Gulf. It's an exciting event, and spectators and camel owners dodge each other's cars to follow closely. But there are no jockeys to no be jockey. seen anywhere. The UAE banned jockeys under 18 in 2005 in response to international pressure. And while there was little faith in the law... Be so there are no camel jockeys anymore. They're, they're all automated. So there's a computer sitting there on the camels asking them to run faster. <clears throat> so uh, just to conclude then, AI sins, imaginary and real. <clears throat> well, on the super intelligence, the picture with Alicia Vikander in her in Ex Machina, it's very far in the distance future. I think we should enjoy the film and not worry about the, the consequences of that too much because the technology is unknown, the risks are unknown, it's far in the distant future, response is unknown. <clears throat> but automation in the jobs market, the technology and risks are very well understood. It is going to ha pan out over the next few decades. And we already know at least a few concrete responses like basic income, regulation, I intelligence automation, or cognitive computing, which is what one could have talked more about. <clears throat> but <clears throat> so this is uh, the, co the conclusion of, in this viewpoint piece that we wrote, and uh, this is AI Sins today. Thanks. So thank you. Any questions? So I, learned, uh, I read an article that um, projects one of the most disconcerting aspects of the AI dangers. So robots as cooks. <laughs> Can you comment <laughs> on that? <laughs> yeah, if, if you read that article, that was comment enough. So I think that the, the, the robot recipe was mixing uh, 
vinegar with uh, with, uh, with soya and vinegar and soya. Uh, yeah, okay. some, some so we should it. stop this <laughs> so before, a, it, before that, that, it gets that, too that, far. That, <laughs> I think that, that example would be the best to convince an Italian audience. I mean, anybody, anything that does food like that is not going to be <laughs> counted as a threat to. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. Mm.